We've all come to a point when we realize we need help. Sometimes the only hurdle keeping us from help and healing is financial. Well, I'm here to tell you about Restoring the Soul's special $1,500 discount. At Restoring the Soul, we understand that many of us struggle financially, especially in these hard times, and that counseling and mental health care can seem unaffordable. So in February and March of 2024, we're offering a special $1,500 discount to our two-week intensive counseling program. At Restoring the Soul, we help couples heal their marriages, we help individuals restore their lives and get their hearts back. So book a two-week intensive during February or March, and you'll receive $1,500 off the total cost of your intensive. You can finally heal from your trauma, overcome compulsive behaviors, or heal what's broken in your marriage or relationships so that you can live the life you're meant to live. Visit RestoringTheSoul.com. Hi, everybody. I'm Michael John Cusick. Welcome back to another episode of the Restoring the Soul podcast. Today, our topic is trauma-informed care. Now, we therapists, psychologists, psychiatrists, and psychiatrists use this term a fair amount. And over the last several years, particularly during the pandemic, the words and the phrase trauma-informed care have taken root all across culture. I hear this used a lot. And I think it's interesting that it's used frequently, but not very well understood. So today, in part one of a two-part podcast on trauma-informed care, I want to talk about what trauma-informed care is, why it's important to understand it. And then in the second podcast, I'm going to circle back around and talk about five pillars of trauma-informed care. First of all, um, it was the year 2018, and Dr. Bruce Perry who has written a number of books, and one of which he's co-authored with uh, the famed Oprah Winfrey called What Happened to You? Conversations on Trauma, Resilience, and Healing. In 2018, Dr. Perry was with Oprah on a special about childhood trauma and childhood adversity, and he, for the first time, used this phrase in a a mass context on Oprah called trauma-informed care. And his outtake in that program on childhood adversity and trauma was only a couple of minutes long, but I believe it was there that this term really began to catch on. Now, prior to that, it was used in clinical settings and in inpatient settings and in research settings to talk about an overall approach to patient care and to client care. And this idea of a trauma-informed approach is not just what a therapist does with you in a counseling session, but an overall way of thinking about providing care and access to people in light of their childhood experiences, in light of the adversity that they've gone through. And as a result of this trauma-informed care, there's a set of emerging best practices that Uh, therapists certainly try to integrate those who specialize in work with uh, trauma and childhood adversity and abuse. But it's also ways that organizations can set up care, access to care, and everything from uh, the lighting in your office to what people experience when they walk in. So as we talk about trauma-informed care, the emerging best practices prior to the five pillars that I want to present are really in the face-to-face clinical counseling situations when a person goes to receive care. And then the other are organizational ways of thinking about uh, proactively about trauma-informed care. And I'm going to give a couple examples of that from even some recent tests that I underwent at a, a cardiac clinic to deal with some palpitations or rather to Uh, get some assessment about what was going on with these palpitations uh, that ended up being caffeine and probably a little bit of stress. The thing about in trauma, uh, trauma trauma-informed care is that the research is showing us that when there is trauma-informed care, that it improves, number one, whether people engage with treatment and in that engagement, whether they continue and stay with the treatment that's needed for particular issues like trauma, abuse, and childhood adversity, but it also produces better outcomes. Trauma-informed care determines whether people engage in therapy, whether they uh, 
continue in therapy. That's what we mental health professionals call client retention. In other words, if people will stay throughout the course of treatment that's needed. And most mental health is not, here's your problem. That'll be 3.5 sessions, and then you'll be on your way. It's an unfolding process. So client retention is important. And then finally, trauma-informed care improves client outcomes. This approach actually impacts uh, whether or not people will be helped and to what degree. Now, it's important as I keep using the word impro- approach or care, trauma-informed care is not a modality. It's not a way of doing therapy particularly or a model of therapy like cognitive therapy or EMDR or gestalt therapy or psychodynamic therapy or interpersonal therapy. It's a broader lens and approach that can allow other forms of therapy to kind of come in underneath it. So typically, when a person has trauma, that could be abuse, neglect, life-threatening events. But as I uh, like to define around here, that trauma is most simply defined as any experience, event, or environment that overwhelms the individual, including their central nervous system, and leaves them without caring, loving resources to cope. I'll say that again. Any event, experience, or environment that overwhelms the individual, that leaves them without loving, supportive resources to cope. Now, this can also include, in light of that environment, and this is really important to say, that trauma in terms of an environment, can be persons of color, minority persons, uh, people that are in poverty situations, people that are experiencing discrimination. So there are uh, systemic issues that those like myself, a, a Caucasian privileged male, may not think of people living in and under discrimination or in lower socioeconomic status with fewer resources to uh, to food, to education, to uh, going from month to month to pay their bills. Those kinds of situations can be chronic stressors and be part of or actual factors in causing trauma. Um, there can be so many realities that cause trauma in environments as well for people who grow up with a family member with mental illness for people who grow up in a family where there is substance abuse or alcoholism. You know, oftentimes people will say in the therapy offices that I've been in over the last 30 years as a professional, and I've had my fair share of being in them as a client as well, you know, I didn't have any specific abuse. I wasn't sexually abused. I wasn't physically abused. Um, I, I don't think I was emotionally abused, but just the environment of growing up in a home where there's mental illness or some kind of significant addiction that can be a history of trauma. So we know that there's massive evidence that where there is uh, an environment of trauma, that that exposure to trauma, especially in childhood, increases the likelihood of health health risks uh, long-term over the person's life. There's a wonderful TED Talk by Dr. Nadine Burke Harris. She's a physician and she has done a lot of great research, but she's one of the people that has popularized uh, the ACE test, A-C-E, which is used to measure uh, adverse childhood experiences. That's what the acronym stands for. And here at Restoring the Soul, that's one of the assessments that we give. It's one of the broadest assessments, but the data that supports this very simple test, I think it's eight questions, is the higher your ACE score is, the greater your adverse childhood experiences the likely higher level of trauma you are, and with or without a trauma diagnosis, the higher your ACE score, the more likely you are to have health-related issues and health risks that are seemingly unrelated to psychological or mental health reasons. Um, And so again, I would encourage you for a compelling and concise explanation of childhood adversity to visit TED.com for Nadine Burke Harris's TED Talk entitled specifically, How Childhood Trauma Affects Health Across a Lifetime. So what is trauma-informed care? 
I've been talking a lot about uh, the overall approach. It's an understanding of how life experiences shape the individual and how that life experience impacts how a person experiences their care. So my life experiences have affected me, my nervous system, my mind in terms of my cognitions, how I see the world, whether I'm hypervigilant, whether I'm not, whether I'm even open to receiving care. You know, over 30 years, three decades in the mental health field, I've seen a lot of different kinds of people. And there's a category of person that for 30 years, they've never been to a doctor. And I'm not judging that. If you can do that and you don't have to go to a doctor, great. But it's oftentimes this reluctance of, I don't want to go and depend on anyone. I don't want to go and find out if I'm vulnerable for advanced testing or screening. I don't want to find out if I've actually got some kind of disease and if I'm sick. So there's this avoidant way of relating to healthy care that this person might even have insurance to receive. So it's not a financial issue. And that avoidance of care is actually a result of how their life experience has shaped them and therefore how they relate to receiving and accessing care. I've worked with so many people over the years who, as a result of their trauma, they say, I'm really great at helping others, but I'm not so great at taking care of myself and I'm not so great at receiving. How can you help me to receive? And oftentimes it's not getting out a book called, you know, how to receive or go to how to receive.com. It's an issue of looking at the person's nervous system and how they have uh, shut down or closed themselves off to that vulnerability. And it might seem like an obvious thought, but that they never were able to receive growing up or in their earlier childhood experiences because that was too vulnerable. They were shamed. They were punished for being needy or for receiving or that they simply couldn't receive because there was nothing there to give them. Nothing was being poured into them in terms of their basic developmental needs. Um, so there are a number of um, organizational competencies that trauma-informed groups use. Generally speaking, those are going to be hospitals and larger clinical settings, but at Restoring the Soul here, we have started to think through what are the the core values that we want to put in place for how people will relate to us? What are the kinds of protocols that we'll put in place? And we've done, I think, a pretty good job about this from when people walk in. You know, we don't have fluorescent lights. We even did a remodel and we don't have LED lights, which have a certain still, not fluorescent, but kind of intensity to it. We have a lot of ambient lighting. And I'm going to come back to things like that more and more but a part of trauma is often neurodiversity or sensory sensitivity in terms of touch, taste, sight, smell, sound. There's sensitivity there. And we have to be proactive and thinking about how clients will experience those kinds of things. There's also a number of guidelines. And today I want to spend just a little bit of time uh, talking about some of those guidelines as it relates to these five pillars. Before I wrap up this particular episode, I want to talk about some key ingredients of what trauma-informed care looks like in an organization and then in a clinical setting. And the first thing in an organization is that, let's just say a hospital, a dentist office, um, and then a physician's office. Those three typical points of contact and care, which outside of the therapy office may be the most common. Uh, the first key ingredient is for the organization to uh, communicate and lead their patients and clients in a process of transformation. Now, what does that mean? At the dentist office, that means that in light of understanding trauma and childhood adverse experiences, that from the time that the patient walks in to check in at the dentist's office till the time that they sit down in the dentist chair to the time when the dentist starts drilling or the hygienist starts doing what they're doing to the time that they check out, that they're proactively thinking through what is the outcome that's desired here today and what might we be needing to think about in terms of serving people well so that they can, A, not simply be comfortable so that they come back and remain our patient, 
but so that they will not be activated, dysregulated, or even traumatized by this experience. Now, nobody likes going to the dentist, but after I was diagnosed in 2003 with complex PTSD, which was a seven to 10 year process of overcoming, I remember a number of times when I had some major dental work done. And prior to going to the dentist's office, I had some major triggering. There's something about laying down in that chair and they tip it back and you may put your sunglasses on and they just kind of start in. And if they're not aware of trauma, that can be very dysregulating. And I remember um, because there was, as I've talked about so often on this podcast, sexual abuse as part of my story. And part of that sexual abuse involved uh, photographs being taken of me as a child the dentist and his assistant wanted to take photographs of my tooth uh, for the before and after they did this implant for where one of my teeth was, was knocked out. And I remember sitting in the chair all the way back and they put this big retractor in my mouth. So my, you know, my mouth looks like it's about six inches wide and, you know, there's everything just wide open. And without asking my permission, without having me sign a release of information, they took those photographs And then they were posted on the website as a before and after example of this doctor's excellent care. Now, I think that was around 2007 or 8, somewhere back in there. I don't know what the ethics were at that time in dentistry. I don't know if the Health Insurance Portability Act, known as HIPAA, was in place at that time. But I would say that at the very least, that dentist and or the assistant should have had a policy in place that said, hey this is your mouth. These are your teeth. This is an incredibly vulnerable situation to be in, A, laying in the dentist chair, B, having your mouth open with this uh, retractor, C, taking a picture of your face, albeit not identified because it was just my mouth on the dentist office website of no tooth with this big gap and then one with the tooth in place. And we'd like to ask you to consider being on our website as a before and after. Now, here's a particular struggle with this. And this is this is why this conversation is so important is because if I'm laying in that chair and if I've had trauma and abuse and if I'm a people pleaser and I happen to be on the Enneagram personality type a two, which is I'm a helper and a giver, it's really hard for me to say no and particularly to an authority and especially when I'm in a place of vulnerability. Do you hear how this is working out? There's no proactive pr- uh, protocol or communication about this process, they're just acting, perhaps ethically, with what works for them. So they might have said beforehand, before you sit down in the dentist chair, we'd like you to take this one-page form and review uh, a practice that we ask clients to participate in. And here's all the parameters of it. Here's what will and will not happen with the photographs. Do you hear how this is all about empowerment And it's about giving me choice or giving the patient or the client choice. It's about giving control, if you will. So I can say no, but I have the opportunity to say no sitting in the lobby when I'm not in a vulnerable position with the retractor in my mouth. By the way, how does one with a retractor in their mouth go, all right, you take the picture. That's not going to work, right? So this is a really good example outside of mental health about a clinical setting. Um, So that is communicating about transformation and being uh, aware and proactive. And in the dentist's office, the transformation is how do you go from your tooth knocked out to having a tooth and leaving the office after however many sessions, appointments, or treatments and be satisfied with that outcome? For many, many, many months, I was very uncomfortable and even had to go and talk to my therapist about what this stirred up in me to have these photographs taken And, you know, I I considered filing a complaint and ultimately I made the decision to not go back to that doctor's office. Now, why did I make that decision? Because they did not have, even though I didn't know the phrase at the time, they did not have a trauma informed approach. As a result of that, my therapist uh, reengaged with something that she used to do uh, long before this moment at my dentist's office. But My therapist used to go to doctors and dentists and educate them back in the 1980s and the early 90s about how to work with clients with abuse and trauma and sexual abuse and physical abuse in particular. The second key ingredient for organizations 
um, is helping clients through involving them in the planning process. So walking them through and saying, here's all the different ingredients of what's happening. And it's all about power or rather it's about empowering the client um, in the midst of the vulnerability of care and allowing them to plan. Okay. Rather than doing your treatments three days apart because you can't do it any sooner, would it feel better to you to have this a week apart, two weeks apart? Um, would it also be better for you to, in a dentist's office, to have nitrous oxide, you know, where you're semi-conscious, or would you like to be awake? A lot of people, they would, with trauma and abuse and childhood adversity, the last thing they would want is to be out of control and on nitrous oxide. And others, they don't want to be awake for that. So all of that is just consideration. And you may be thinking, wow, this would take a lot of extra time and energy and thoughtfulness on the part of these caregivers. And I would say, yes, that's correct. But remember, the evidence suggests that the outcomes are better. Outcomes in terms of engaging in treatment, being retained in treatment, and the outcome. Uh, the third piece of this trauma-informed care for an organization is training for key staff members, both clinical and non-clinical. That would be the person at the check-in when you come and say, hi, I'm here for doctor or dentist appointment. If you're really nervous, they might say, um, uh, the doctor will be about 15 minutes. We're so sorry that they're running behind as opposed to that nervous or anxious client sitting in the lobby and just waiting, wondering when they're going to come out. They may say, if there's something in the client's chart about a history of trauma, they may say, you know, we have another section of the waiting room, or if you'd like to step inside, here's an empty room where the lights are lower and it's a little bit more quiet. Would you be more comfortable sitting there? So sometimes uh, clinical training allows for uh, the employees and the caregivers and non-clinical people to engage in other ways that are extra intensive. By the way, years ago, uh, I had over a period of about three or four years, I had nine kidney stones. And some of those involve surgery. And I remember going to my doctor, the urologist, and telling him, I am in the midst of uh, healing from trauma, an extended course of therapy regarding sexual abuse. Can you please put a note in my file? And the doctor took a deep breath and he exhaled and he said, thank you for telling me that. Let's deal with this right now. And he literally stood up, invited me out of his office, walked over to this big room that was the medical records section. And he very kindly and gently spoke to this young woman that was the re medical records specialist. And he said, we're going to put a label on the outside of this chart and at the entry point when people click into it. And I'm not sure if this was a policy that they had at the time or if the doctor just initiated this, but I remember being so touched. The doctor wrote history of trauma and childhood abuse. And then there were certain uh, things of awareness where I wanted to have um, certain kinds of medication. I wanted to be uh, basically anesthetized fully as opposed to just a mild sedation for kidney stone treatment because of how that could be re-traumatizing. And to think of not having that, it really became a big deal. And um, I'll just share this because it's what happened. But I remember spending many sessions over a period of weeks and weeks talking with my therapist about whether or not I was actually worthy of requesting this certain kind of care. So you can, again, see how important this is, not just at the organizational level, not just at the clinical level, but in terms of how people can self-advocate and how the invitation is there for this. Um, overall, organizationally, a trauma-informed approach is about creating a safe environment from what I call soup to nuts, from beginning to end of the experience. And that is really to prevent secondary traumatization from staff that are not intentionally doing this. That means that with certain people, they're going to have information ahead of time or to anticipate or simply to have a way of relating and being in the office so that there's not ongoing trauma that happens as a result of policies and practices. Another example from the dentist office. And if anybody wants to hire me as a consultant to uh, work with the dentist office to give my opinion, I'm half kidding about that. But um, so I, I've been in the dental chair and they come after drilling and examining and doing an exam and they say, 
so would you like, uh, or no, they'll say it's our policy to give you the financial information about this. So while laying back with these sunglasses on, completely vulnerable, they come and they bring a clipboard and they start reading numbers and figures about how much this is going to cost. So it's going to cost $2,500, let's say, to repair your tooth. Would you like to go ahead and do that now? I would suggest that that's not only not trauma-informed, but that that has the potential to be re-traumatizing. I mean, if I was at a car dealership and the salesman said to me, would you you know, like to take that car home with you today, I would feel pressured and maybe anxious, and I'd want to leave that situation or at best say, hey, I need some time. Let me go to lunch with my wife, and we're going to come back. We're going to think about it. But in the dentist chair, with the power differential of expertise, with that vulnerable physical position, um, I don't think it gives people the ability to make good choices and good decisions. So um, the trauma-informed perspective is about creating safety in a way that prevents secondary trauma from staff. The clinical aspect of trauma-informed care, this is what it would look like um, specifically in medical situations, in the face-to-face, at at a level lower than the 30,000-foot organizational level. And um, it's involving people in the treatment process. So it would be the dentist, the hygienist, or even the medical assistant, where I recently had a physical who comes in and says, I'm going to put the blood pressure cuff on your arm right now. Are you ready for that? Is that all right? Uh, and you prefer left or right arm. That may happen. But then if they need to ask you to take off your shirt or your top, you know, the blood pressure cuff isn't going to work over that sweatshirt or over that flannel shirt. So I'm going to need you to take your top off. Would you like me to step out? And would you like to have a gown on? Um, because what happened at my office was they said, take off your shirt. And I'm sitting there from the waist up with uh, bare chested. And in ever so subtle a way, they could have said or may have had a proactive stance that was more uh, anticipatory, proactive, and considerate of that situation. Now, in that instance, it didn't traumatize me, but I know many, many people that that would traumatize. And I've sat with people over and over and over again and said, what would it have been like for you to speak up in that moment? And those the person says, I, I never would speak up. I, I, I wouldn't possibly speak up in that situation, even though I felt ashamed, embarrassed, and terrified. The second thing, and this is just so obvious, but it doesn't happen, and that is screening for trauma. At my particular doctor's office, there's two assessments that you get. when The minute you go into the examination room and they say the doctor will be here shortly, they hand you a clipboard with the PHQ-9. That's the patient health questionnaire. And we use this at Restoring the Soul on the first day of every intensive because it's like taking vital signs. It's like taking pulse, respirations, blood pressure. And um, it's just a simple way of finding out people's level of depression and anxiety And then we give a trauma inventory, and that is somebody might have filled out the paperwork one, two, or three months ago, but this allows there to be a fresh report and a way of screening for this so that even if a person doesn't have post-traumatic stress disorder or something uh, that significant, we know whether there are adverse experiences in their life that might make it important to relate to them in a particular way. At the clinical level, it's important for staff to be trained in specific treatment approaches. Uh, So in therapy, this would be things like EMDR, brain spotting, which is a popular trauma treatment, although we don't do that at Restoring the Soul, somatic experiencing, somatic interventions, um, attachment work, uh, polyvagal work, interpersonal neurobiology cognitive therapy, and spiritual kinds of interventions. All of these approaches would be about helping understand a person's nervous system as it relates to their life experience with the assumption that they have the potential to be activated or uh, dysregulated in uh, a situation where they're vulnerable. The final aspect of trauma-informed care at the clinical face-to-face level is knowing lots of resources So that if you are not a shotgun, one size fits all kind of mental health clinic where you can deal with everything, let's just say that you specialize in sexual abuse 
or in addictions treatment with trauma as part of that background. Having referrals is we can't help you, but we know a really great resource that will. And oftentimes people will make referrals in mental health for, I saw this person's name on a website and it says that they do trauma, so I'm referring you there versus a referral that can be made with we have a specific relationship with this particular person and we know that they're safe. We know that they're going to respect your trauma, understand your trauma and help you get the care that you need. So that is trauma informed care from the 30,000 foot view from this overall approach to patient care. And in our next conversation, we're going to talk about the five pillars of trauma informed care as it relates to restoring the soul. We'll talk to you next time. So we've wrapped up another episode of Restoring the Soul. We want you to know that Restoring the Soul is so much more than a podcast. In fact, the heart of what we have done for nearly 20 years is intensive counseling. When you can't wait months or years to get out of the rut you're in, our intensive counseling programs in Colorado allow you to experience deep change in half-day blocks over two weeks. To learn more, visit RestoringTheSoul.com. That's RestoringTheSoul.com. You already know we live in a pornified world, but most of us are at a loss for how to navigate this sea of temptation. It's either ceaseless striving on the one hand or giving in to brokenness on the other. But doesn't the gospel offer us another way? The truth is that our sexual struggles are not actually about sex, but about a misdirected, God-given longing for deep connection. Dig deeper in my book, Surfing for God, Discovering the Divine Desire Beneath Sexual Struggle. 